Take one. Which is more important for muscle growth, progressive overload or the mind-muscle connection? So to my knowledge, there's no research investigating this question. So this is purely theoretical, but I'm pretty confident in my answer. I always use this hypothetical twin example to illustrate the point. You know, let's say a pair of twins start lifting weights. Both of them weigh 200 pounds, just to make it easy, you know? And they're both 20% body fat, okay? So twin number one, he focuses on the mind-muscle connection. He does this for two years. So every exercise he does, he's just squeezing and, you know, using r super good form, squeezing the weight, pausing at the top of the contraction and lowering under control. And the other twin instead focuses on getting stronger, setting PRs. And he does that for two years. At the end of this time period, you know, at the end of two years, let's say they had the same routine, they did the same exercises, the only thing that was different is how they performed the exercise, and then their focus would obviously dictate the loading you know, that they used. So twin one would obviously be going lighter and wouldn't be so focused on always going up in strength, whereas twin number two would only be focused on going up in reps, or weight over time. But let's say they mostly did compound movements, you know? They did bench press, you know, incline press, military press, dips, chin ups, pull downs, rows, squats, lunges, deadlifts, hip thrusts. And let's say they still threw in you know, a little bit of leg extensions and leg curls and kickbacks and 45 degree hypers, you know, lateral raises, some flies, some lat prayers, rear delt raises, some curls and tricep extensions, but say 70% of their volume was compound movements, 30% single joint. My guess is that at the end of the two year period, you know, let's say they had the same diet, they, they, get, they got their protein in, they ate around a gram per pound of body weight per day. At the end of this two year period, my guess is that twin two would be more muscular than twin number one. My guess is that twin number one now might be, you know, 200 pounds and say 15% body fat, but twin two would be 200 pounds and, you know, like 10 to 12% body fat. Now, let me first make a case for the mind-muscle connection. So around 10 years ago, this big debate in the industry started, you know, what's best for strength and muscle hypertrophy? What type of cues should trainers and coaches use when working with their clients or athletes? Should they use an internal focus attention or an external focus of attention? And what that means is an internal focus of attention, you're focusing on your body, something within your body. Whereas an external focus has you focus on something outside the body, some target or you know something in the environment. And there are so many studies, there's like you know over a hundred studies looking at performance and with regards to performance, an external attentional focus is always better. You know, it always reigns supreme. If you want more force production, someone's doing a bench press, you're not gonna be like, okay, I want you to really feel your triceps doing the job. You're gonna say, explode up, you know, I want you to blast that weight off your chest, fight through the sticking region, and envision yourself throwing that bar through the ceiling. Say you're doing a broad jump, you're not gonna be like, all right, lean forward, and I want you to really feel your glutes explode and propel you forward. No, instead you're gonna say, look, see this distance right here? Pretend this is a fire pit. You gotta clear that or you're gonna die. I want you jumping to right there. You're gonna give them a target and they're gonna focus on that and they might beat that target, you know? Even if it's like accuracy, if someone's throwing a dart, you're not gonna tell them, you know, how to contract their tricep. That'll just throw them off. You're gonna instead give them some environmental cue like you're gonna say, ignore the big dart board, you know, the whole circle. I want you to only focus on that little bullseye area throw it right there. So anything performance related, whether it's strength or force or power and speed or accuracy, you know, putting a golf ball, throwing a dart. In all those scenarios, an external attentional focus is superior to an internal attentional focus. So 10 years ago, the whole industry was saying, Oh, external cues are always better than internal cues for everything. And I'm pretty proud of myself because back then I said, no, you know, there are times when internal attention focus is valid. For example, with hypertrophy, fixing form. So I made a chart and there were some industry guys who got upset at me because they were so tied to this external attentional focus. You know, they weren't being objective. And I made this chart that said, yes, for anything performance related external, but for basically hypertrophy and fixing form, like if you want someone to not cave in at the knees, you just say knees out. <laughs> you know, don't let your knees cave in, push your knees out, and then you do a better job with your form. Sometimes you need to draw a lifter's attention to something going on within his body. But there was no research looking into this until my friend Brad Schoenfeld, I was on this paper, he conducted a study that looked at whether or not 
an external or internal attentional focus was superior for hypertrophy, and he looked at curls and leg extensions. Now, the quads did not show a superiority for the internal cue, but the biceps did. The group that focused on the biceps contracting saw better results than the group that just focused on the load being moved. So chalk one up for the mind-muscle connection. That's the first and only paper, to my knowledge, looking at the effects of attentional focus on hypertrophy. However, prior to that, there were probably, I'd say, 10 studies involving muscle activation showing that when you do focus on the muscle, you do activate that muscle to a greater degree. So for example, if you are doing a glute bridge and you focus on squeezing your glutes, you're gonna use your glutes more and there's some evidence that suggests that you end up using other muscles less. And I did my own experiments back in the day, and I found that experienced lifters could kind of steer their muscle activity towards one muscle group over another. You know, you could squat using your quads and not so much your glutes, or vice versa. And when you focused on using a certain muscle, that muscle activation did indeed go up, and oftentimes the synergist activation would go down, which is cool because that has implications for injury prevention. And also back then, you know, 10 years back, people would say hypertrophy is about force production, tension. You can have more tension when you produce more total force, and these studies show that you produce greater force when you focus externally, so therefore it's better for hypertrophy. But the problem with that line of research is they're looking at ground reaction force, you know? Do a squat or a deadlift and you will produce greater force, but that's ground reaction force, okay? That's, you lift heavier weight, you put more force into the ground, but that does not equal muscle force, okay? There's a lot of muscles involved in the deadlift, a lot of muscles involved in the squat as well. So just because you lifted more weight, it does not mean that you used your glutes to a greater degree. You know, you could have squatted more weight because you used your quads more. You had better timing of muscle activation that led to the greatest amount of weight being lifted. And one of the leading authors on this line of research, her name is Dr. Gabriel Wolf. She's published more studies on attentional focus than anyone. She has this constrained action hypothesis that indicates that, you know, with something involving performance, when you focus on something externally, on something in the environment, your body activates the precise motor units in the right combination in the different muscles that maximizes performance. So your body has a natural way of doing things. By focusing externally, your neuromuscular system is going to work perfectly to execute that task. Whereas if you focus on one of the muscles, you're going to overactivate that muscle and maybe screw up the timing and it's gonna interfere with performance. And basically what we're finding is, yes, that is true. You don't wanna use the mind-muscle connection when you're doing something performance-related. If you're focused on hypertrophy, then you do want to focus internally at least some of the times. Another reason for utilizing the mind-muscle connection is that every bodybuilder swears by it. You constantly hear bodybuilders say, you know, I never felt my pecs in a bench press until I really learned to bench like a bodybuilder and use my pecs. I've had clients who don't feel their glutes much in a hip thrust initially, and then after a couple months, their glutes burn so bad it brings tears to their eyes. I remember when I first started lifting at 15 years old, I didn't know how to flex my lats. I would sit there in the mirror and I'd be like, you know, trying to contract my lats. It took me a while to figure out how to flex them. I remember my delts, I was like, how can I, what pose makes me <laughs> activate my deltoids? And I would just sit there in the mirror flexing and looking at myself in the mirror and flexing different muscles. And I believe that helped my performance in the long run, because if I'm doing a lat pull down and I can't contract my lats, how am I gonna do it properly? In the book Super Training, Dr. Mel Siff called it loadless training. That's flexing and posing, right? And there are a couple of studies that show that, you know, just flexing and posing do in fact grow muscle. And one study indicates that it packs on muscle just as effectively as dumbbells do. So now I've presented evidence in support of the mind-muscle connection. But I'm gonna tell you why I still favor progressive overload. Progressive overload, especially on compound movements, is so effective because you're activating a lot of different muscles. And I think people underestimate all these little muscles, you know? Check out someone's back development, you know? You think, oh, that's all lats coming up. No, back here is the teres major and minor, and they're big muscles, you know? There's also the supraspinatus, and you look at a very well-developed back, and you see those muscles contribute a lot to the overall back development. You know, speaking of the back, you've got the erectors underneath. You know, you've got the lats. You've also have 
the, the traps, which are diamond shaped, you've got the upper, mid, and lower portion, and the rhomboids. So if you're just trying to squeeze the weight and feel a certain muscle, you're not gonna get as strong over time, and it's gonna limit your performance and the weight that you could be using. Now, I've definitely seen really jacked dudes at the gym who just do mind-muscle connection stuff. You know, you see them like doing just body weight dips, but squeezing and really focusing on the movement. And you know, you see them doing curls with light dumbbells, but they're just squeezing using just perfect form. And you're like, wow, that guy's using such light weight, but he's jacked. But you see so many more instances where guys are just freakishly strong and they have a very well-developed physique. I rarely see a guy who can do a weighted chin up with 100 pounds, military press 200 pounds, bench press 300 pounds, squat 400 pounds, deadlift 500 pounds, and hip thrust 600 pounds and have a lackluster physique. I'm sure you can find someone out there, but it's rare. Because when you do a chin up, you're working the lats, you're working the forearms, you're working the biceps. The chin up is one of the best ab exercises in existence, surprisingly. When you do military press, you know, you're not just working the delts well, you're also working the triceps, you're working the upper back musculature. Bench press is obviously gonna work the pecs, the front delts, the triceps. Squats are gonna work the erectors, they're gonna work the glutes, the quads. Deadlifts are gonna work, you know, the hamstrings, the glutes, the quads, the whole back musculature, the forearms, and hip thrusts are gonna work the glutes really well, but also the hamstrings and quads, but also all the little muscles that get worked just by moving heavy, heavy weight around, and that adds up. And that's what contributes to twin number two being overall leaner than twin number one. So that's why I believe that progressive overload is more important than the mind-muscle connection. However, this whole video is nonsense because it's what's called the black or white fallacy. Luckily in strength training, you don't have to do one or the other, you do them both. And I always say in my seminars, there's two necessary paths to maximize hypertrophy. You know, you have the progressive overload path and the mind-muscle connection path. And they're both necessary. Think of the yin and the yang, you know? You gotta have them both. One without the other will lead to suboptimal gains. So to wrap this up, if I had to pick one, I would choose setting PRs and getting stronger. But in the real world, you don't have to choose between the two. You would do them both. So what I recommend is the first exercise of the day Go for progressive overload. Do heavier weight, lower rep ranges, but then towards the end of the workout, more single joint exercises, more exercises where you can just go lighter and really squeeze the muscle and feel the burn. So instead, this video should involve triplets, you know? <laughs> Triplet one just does my muscle connection. Triplet two does progressive overload. Triplet three does both. And he ends up being the most ripped and jacked. All right, that's a wrap. I hope you enjoy the video. Please make sure you're subscribed to my channel. Definitely hit like if you appreciate the content. And please leave me a message. Let me know how I'm doing. I have a lot of good content planned for the rest of 2022. Thank you for watching this video.